to continue, um, I would like to, to ask two questions to the panelists, because there is this point of disagreement uh, between um, uh, Mr. Akita and Renaud Girard about, uh, about China. For, for Mr. Akita, China is in a better position, and uh, for Renault, uh, in a sense, China is in a worst uh, position. So my first question is for the three other panelists. After AUKUS, how do you assess Chinese position? Is it better or is it, uh, is it uh, worse? So that's, for the, for, that's for my first question. The second one is addressed to Mr. Akita and um, Renaud Girard in line with uh, the, the last words by uh, Professor Wang Jizi about Taiwan, because you, you, don't, you, don't, you, didn't, uh, you have not sorry, elaborated uh, in your uh, various statement about Taiwan, and I would be interested in knowing your respective views on, on that. <laughs> so maybe to start with Ambassador Li about uh, China position, um, what do you, how do you assess it? My opinion, I think there is no change for China. It is a kind of anticipated path. Because the Biden stressed the importance of enlisting partners and allies in his combat against China, even before he took office. So that is the way we anticipated, in a way to to enlist uh, partners and allies. And uh, which is uh, interesting to me is the, the drastic change of United Kingdom's positions. Mm -hmm. UK was first European countries to support uh, AIDB a month ahead of expression of support by France, Germany, and Italy. But now they joined the camp of the United States in dealing with China. Mm -hmm. I think that is because of the Hong Kong issues. Um, I think uh, China now tried to avoid isolation. One way of this is to apply for CPTPP, knowing that it will not be possible for China to join the CPTPP because the CPTPP for uh, TPP is uh, unanimous consent is required to accept the new members. At this moment, it is impossible for TPP 11 countries give unanimous support to China. But however, China has nothing to lose in applying for the CPTPP because if denied, it is the the fault of CPTPP who refused China's effort to join international effort for further liberalization of trade. So I think uh, uh, with the regard to Akus, China's effort to out of isolation will continue. Thank you very much. So, so about this, this first question, this very first question about your assessment of chi Chinese position, is it better or is it, is it uh, more, more difficult for China right now? I, I have a rather uh, conflictual position. <clears throat> China is strong, but I think it's also at one of its peak moments. I, I see the... Uh, that there are in, it's not the United States or the rest of the world which is going to be a problem for, the, for China. I think it is certain inner tensions within the Chinese Communist Party which are not yet apparent. <clears throat> in some ways, I see Xi Jinping's position with what Mao's position was in 1958-59. There are tensions. There are many things that Xi is doing, which of course the democratic world sees uh, difficult, but I think in the Chinese Communist Party, there are many who feel that in a bid to, to ram, uh, for sure, ram through a whole lot of uh, ideas, plans, when it's for his own position for the future, his own thoughts for the future, if I might say so, there are tensions. I think it would well worth the democratic world to see that, rather than I think the AUKUS and the Quad and the 
all the various the other trade tensions that are present. I think these are not going to meet me. Can we, can we widen the fault lines within the Chinese Communist Party, which are not too apparent, mm -hmm. apparent, I'm sure, to more detailed scholars than myself. How do we use that? How do we exploit it? I think that's probably far better than sending um, five squadrons of the of militarily equipped uh, planes and whatnot. So I, I think there is something which I have not seen it, but I, I, I live in, in India. I don't see much of scholarly dissertation on what are the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party tension. It used to be, we used to get much more in the past. It's not apparent. But from what I see, there is something which is there, and I think it's well worth, and maybe this could be the theme for the next major dissertation of, the, of global governance of the Thank you. Okay. I, I return to Professor Wang Jizi on this uh, first question. It would be interesting in, uh, in having your, your assessment, Professor. Are you... so first question, I didn't hear you. Ah, okay. So, you know, there was, there was a point of discussion at the beginning of our session between uh, Mr. Akita and Girard. For Mr. Akita, uh, China is in a better position. And for uh, Renaud Girard, China is in a more difficult uh, position. And uh, what is your views on that? Okay. Uh, I think uh, China is uh, in a difficult position to expand its influence. Its material power is very strong. <laughs> Thank you. Um, now I turn to my second question, uh, which is uh, focused on, on, on Taiwan. So, Rono, if you can go first, and I will um, turn to Mr. Akita afterwards. Je pense, est-ce qu'on entend là? Oui, là ça marche. Euh, je pense qu'en fait, <coughs> dans euh, ce grand match euh, qui euh, s'inscrit dans l'histoire, parce qu'à un moment on a cru que euh, la rivalité sino-américaine euh, était due simplement à Trump. On voit qu'en fait euh, Biden continue totalement euh, la politique de Trump à l'égard euh, de la Chine. Donc c'est quelque chose qui s'inscrit dans un grand mouvement historique. Je pense que, avec notamment la, la signature de ce traité AUKUS, je pense qu'en fait, la Chine a perdu un premier set, c'est un match de tennis au moins en 5-7, comme à Wimbledon. La Chine a perdu le premier set, mais elle n'a pas perdu le match. Je pense que L'objectif principal de Xi Jinping, je ne sais pas s'il si va vouloir rester au pouvoir au-delà de euh, 2027. Je crois que s'il veut rester au-delà de 2027, il devra changer les statuts du Parti communiste chinois. Enfin, euh, ça ne le gênera pas trop, parce qu'il a déjà euh, changé euh, la constitution. Mais je pense que son objectif principal, ce qu'il veut léguer à la Chine, de son passage au pouvoir, c'est la récupération de Taïwan. Je pense que même sa frise chez lui a l'obsession, sinon ces manœuvres aériennes, ce viol assez fréquent du, de l'espace aérien taïwanais par les avions de chasse chinois n'aurait strictement aucun sens. Donc je crois que c'est... Euh, mais euh, mais je ne pense pas que dans ce conflit, la Chine souhaite livrer bataille. La Chine, depuis Sun Tzu, veut gagner les guerres sans livrer bataille. Donc je ne vois pas du tout une bataille de la guerre de Corail, une bataille de Midway pour euh, le contrôle de Taïwan. Je vois plutôt une stratégie... Euh, sur deux axes. Le premier axe 
est évidemment une cinquième colonne à l'intérieur de Taïwan grâce au parti Kuomintang qui s'affaiblit euh, par rapport au parti de Madame Tsai, mais qui est quand même très présent. Je crois qu'il y a une vraie politique euh, de la Chine continentale à l'égard du parti euh, du Kuomintang à, à Taïwan. Et la deuxième politique, c'est effectivement c'est une politique de patience. Nous allons attendre, nous, Chinois, que les Américains se lassent. Nous les avons vus se lasser en Indochine et finalement abandonner l'Indochine après être arrivé en Indochine vers 1955, comme le raconte le roman Un Américain bien tranquille. Ils sont partis en 1975, ils ont tout laissé. Ils se sont, nous, avons, nous, Chinois, nous les avons vus euh, se lasser en Mésopotamie. On fait toute une intervention. Nous les avons vus se lasser euh, en Afghanistan. Euh, finalement, nous avons vu les Américains donner, après l'invasion de l'Irak, euh, l'Irak à l'Iran. Et puis nous, 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 nous les remercions parce qu'ils viennent de nous donner sur un plateau d'argent l'Afghanistan avec tous ses métaux rares et son lithium. Et euh, ça va nous permettre à nous Chinois de faire notre route de la soie à travers l'Afghanistan. Donc, en fait, je pense que le calcul chinois, c'est simplement d'avoir une patience stratégique et d'attendre que les Américains, pour une raison ou pour une autre, qui peut être une raison de politique intérieure américaine, que les Américains se retirent et que donc les Taïwanais comprennent qu'ils n'ont pas d'autre choix que rejoindre euh, la Chine et négocier le maximum d'autonomie. Et c'est comme ça, je pense, que la Chine a envie, euh, de, avec évidemment la construction d'une marine extrêmement forte pour intimider, avec la poursuite évidemment de la cyberguerre, parce que les Chinois font une cyberguerre permanente, pas seulement comme le, contre l'Australie en ce moment, mais aussi, évidemment, pour espionner en France et aux États-Unis, euh, la cyberguerre et chez les Chinois est euh, permanente. Mais c'est une stratégie de rapport de force. Je ne pense pas qu'on va vers la guerre chaude, la guerre navale, telle qu'on avait connue euh, dans la première guerre du Pacifique. Cette guerre, cette deuxième guerre du Pacifique qui a commencé, est une guerre de rapport de force, une guerre d'intimidation euh, avec l'usage de la okay. cyberguerre et qui a pour but d'obtenir que les Taïwanais eux-mêmes se livrent euh, à la Chine simplement au regard des rapports de force. Ce que tu nous rappelles, c'est que le cinquième set se joue au tie-break. Voilà. Euh, Mr. Akita, what, what are your views on, on, on Taiwan okay. Yeah, yeah, thank you very much. Before I go to Taiwan, I, let me briefly elaborate uh, the, why I think China is in a favorable position. Uh, if I put China as a person, China has a big muscle, China has more money, and China live in a more favorable geopolitical location. So I think China is in a favorable position. But also, China has a full of problem inside his family. Like an income gap, like a person once said, shortage of electricity, and also a lack of the social welfare system. So I think that in the long run, uh, China is a decline, China will be a declining empire and also the instability of the political system will arise. But in the long run, I think that China will lose the favorability. So that's why China tried to do everything they can do now. So that is my point. And on Taiwan, I, I echo uh, a French participant's uh, analysis. I don't think that China have uh, enough capability guarantee itself to win the full-scale war. China can destroy Taipei or China can land on Taiwan, but the, it doesn't have sufficient military power to take over Taiwan. 
by resisting all kind of a counter attack from US or other allies. So I think there are two likely scenario. First scenario is uh, similar to Russian uh, hybrid war against Crimea 2014. So Ch China may conduct massive cyber attack or cut under sea cable and to disrupt Taiwan or you know, spread fake news so that they can weaken the Taiwan political entity gradually and then uh, find some chance in the long run to annex Taiwan. But another scenario is a 1937 Japan and China scenario. Japan and China didn't have an intention to fight total uh, full-scale war, but uh, triggering, triggered by the conflict at the Marco Polo Bridge near Beijing. Uh, both countries uh, uh, gradually engaged into a full-scale war. So there is a risk that due to the miscalculation, the US and China will uh, face a serious conflict without uh, intention. Thank you. Thank you very much. So we are ending the, this, uh, this session. I would like to thank, of course, all the, all the panelists for uh, their contribution. I think it was very uh, substantial because we had the chance to have a, a view from, uh, from Europe, a view from Japan, a view from Korea, a view from, uh, from India, and a view from, uh, from the US and from uh, China. So thank you for all of us, and I would suggest to applaud you and to, to, to be back for the next session. Thank you very much.